Yo, what's up? Dr. Swole here, MD, pro physique athlete. Today I'm joined again by Menno Henselmans. Thanks for being on the show, Menno. My pleasure as always. Today we're going to be talking about fat loss. So we're going to start from the ground up. We're going to be talking about calories, macros, and we'll see how far we get and really get into the science of losing fat and maintaining or continuing to build muscle. So yeah, Menno, I think it's been a while since, you know, I don't know, we've ever talked about fat loss actually together but this will be a good one I think for people I think just starting out as a broad overview if someone's trying to plan a fat loss phase say they have a substantial amount of fat to lose how should they kind of set up this fat loss phase like the length of the phase how much they should try and lose I mean the most important thing is simply how much do you want to lose so you can you can kind of do the math and if you know your body fat percentage or you have a pretty good idea and you know to which body fat percentage you want to go and then depending on what happens to your lean body mass like if you assume it's constant the math is relatively easy to do and then you can calculate the net metabolizable energy which is i think it's 8260 calories per kilo of adipose tissue roughly that you need to lose net and yeah, then you can see how long it's going to take you at a given energy deficit to uh, to get there. But I think for most people, it's more important to just simply get into the target energy deficit that their current body fat percentage warrants with higher body fat percentages warranting higher energy deficits or at least allowing for higher energy deficits and then just taking it from there. I think for a lot of people, it's much more important to get into a good routine now rather than to plan you know the fat loss phase is going to last eight weeks or it's i'm going to lose x percent body fat or x kilos of muscle uh, or fat i think for for most people it's much more important to focus on the process and the journey especially in terms of short-term goal setting rather than aiming for the end point because in particular because very often you see that when you kind of get into a good groove and things are going well people want to get a lot leaner than they think they do in the first place Mm -hmm. as you know as a competitor you know the difference between just lean and being shredded is actually still massive yeah yeah no i actually like that kind of having that open-ended kind of fat loss phase approach like when you're especially if someone doesn't have a lot of experience with actually running fat loss phases um so yeah i guess the the next main question would be in terms of setting up calories how should people go about that it would recommend going by an energy deficit. So what I do with my clients and what I teach my students in my PT courses is to estimate all the individual factors and then like your BMR, your firmic effect of food, your physical activity level, your strength training energy expenditure, just adding it all up together, which is not too difficult when you, you have a set method and then uh, selecting an energy deficit based on how high someone's body fat percentage is and how advanced they are. So if someone is really advanced and they're very lean, then you probably only want to be in a 5% deficit or so. Like some, some of my clients are just having a 2.5% deficit. Like you really want to take it slow. If you're going from five to 4% body fat as a guy and you want to cling on to every bit of muscle and you have the time, then slow is the way to go. Mm. But if you have say an obese client or uh, if, if you're obese and you just want to get to you know a healthy body fat level, then you really don't need to worry at all about muscle loss. Most research has found that for obese individuals, the rate of weight loss and lean body mass losses are almost unrelated. So there's so much fat to lose for the body that the it, it's very easy for the body to prioritize fat loss. Because the, the problem occurs when you're sufficiently lean that the body now has to weigh, okay, are we going to burn fat or are we going to burn muscle? And what energy deficit does is it creates a stress. It creates a stress for the body to catabolize some tissues to free up energy. Like the body needs that energy to fuel your heart, your lungs, tissues, movement. And you're not consuming as much energy. So your negative energy balance, you're not consuming as much energy as you're expending. So the body has to catabolize some of its own tissues to make up the deficit. Mm -hmm. And if you have a lot of muscle mass and very little fat mass, then the priorities for your body become well we have a lot of muscle mass and it's very energetically um, dense tissue it's energetically um, inefficient to maintain the muscle mass because it also takes a lot of energy to maintain the muscle mass whereas the fat mass we don't have a lot of it and it's very easy to keep it doesn't require a lot of maintenance to keep fat around so the leaner and more muscular you get 
the bigger the stress for the body to start metabolizing muscle instead of fat. And that's what you don't want. So you want to keep the stress low enough. And then all the other factors also come into play for you know, sleep, stress management, optimal protein intake, nutrient timing, all of these things matter, just like they matter for muscle growth. And the more optimized your diet is in general, the harder you can push the energy deficit because the body still won't catabolize muscle mass. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of a continuum, as you say, of, you know, as you become more advanced and when you're getting into those more extreme sort of ranges of body composition. Say we're talking about someone who is, you know, relatively lean, maybe like as a guy, 10 to 15% body fat, like what are kind of ranges of, you know, deficits that people should aim for? Typically in that uh, type of clientele, assuming most things are normal, I would uh, recommend like a 10 to 30% deficit. So, and then again, depending on how optimized everything is and personal preferences, how hard you're going to push within that range will determine where exactly you want to fall. I mean, some you can always go slower as well, of course, but I think there's not much need to stick with only 5% deficit. If you want to get the fat loss out, uh, going now, then I think 10% is generally a good minimum and 30% is as fast as I think you can push it realistically in most cases without sacrificing muscle in the process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Yeah, I think as the deficits get more aggressive, I mean, less aggressive, like if you if someone tries to take it really slow, especially if they're not very experienced, they can you know, start running to the issues of like tracking, trackability as, um, as well as just kind of opportunity cost of the time you're spending in a deficit is the way I see it. Yeah, it's, I mean, like long term, because this is something studies often don't look at, also with diet breaks and the like, you also have to weigh in, like you said, the, the cost of the time saved, and that time could have been spent bulking. So yeah, it's great if you're you're taking it super slow, because that's also one approach, and I, I know that some people advocate this, just go super slow. Like the minimum viable deficit is always the best, is basically their approach. The, the problem with that is, yeah, you're not going to lose any muscle. Maybe you can even gain some during the, the dieting phase, but it's not going to be a lot of muscle growth typically, especially not in an advanced trainee. And then you're taking forever to get the fat off and you're probably been better off maybe even sacrificing a little bit of muscle or at least just, just, you know, cling on to as much as you can. And then having a lot of time left to bulk where you can relatively easily rebuild that muscle due to muscle memory and then getting back to um, or getting to a new peak level of muscle mass, then the overall time balance is better. And actually, in terms of the research now, that balance, when you factor in not just what happens during the cutting phase, but also like long term, where are you best off with the bulking phase factored in? We mm -hmm. actually don't have great research on that. So you have to we have to kind of uh, guesstimate it based on our experience. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting question and I feel like it'd be difficult to look at it in the research just because you have to track people for so long and mm -hmm. and you know you need people adhering going on to macros I think this would be the next juicy topic to get into with relate as it relates to fat loss so yeah how do you like to approach setting up macros very similar to when bulking overall the difference mainly arises out of necessity when your calories go below the level where you ideally want your protein, fat, and carbs. Mm -hmm. So for, for most people, there is a certain amount of fat that you would want them to have for optimal hormonal functioning. Uh, fats also have some anabolic effects. You want your set of essential fatty acids, you know, omega freeze And well, depending on the diet, you also want a decent amount of carbs, maybe. That, that's actually questionable. Like my latest um, re systematic review on this suggests that you can go even keto without loss, uh, without sacrificing performance in the long run. And then there's protein, which of course you want enough protein. And I think most people or many people, now it's it's very controversial, will will say you want more protein in energy deficit. And my approach is actually that there's no difference. And there is it's a fact that there is no research directly showing there is a difference. And we actually have a lot of research in untrained individuals at least directly showing there is no difference in protein requirements in energy deficit versus at maintenance. So my approach is generally similar proportional macros. Uh, just when you get to the level where you have to sacrifice on one of them, say you want 200 gram carbs, uh, 80 gram fat and 150 gram protein, and you don't have the calories for that, then you have to start weighing, okay, where am I going to compromise? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, the protein thing is interesting. I think I think it's something that people have talked a lot about, where people tell you that you need you got to jack up your protein when you're trying to lose fat. What's kind of yeah, like the argument or you know for and against that? Yeah, so the history of that goes back to mostly to a paper by Eric Helms. So he did his, his thesis, I think it was, for his PhD on protein requirements, and he wrote an extremely extremely popular paper arguing that protein requirements increase in energy deficit. And then we, we had a great theory to support it, which, I mean, it's mostly intuitive. You, there's greater protein breakdown and greater risk of muscle loss, so maybe more protein can help uh, ward off that muscle loss. If you look at protein kinetics, like what happens to protein synthesis, protein breakdown, it's actually not very logical that protein needs would increase, uh, I would argue, because protein synthesis levels go down a lot and protein breakdown levels only increase when you get into quite severe energy deficits, typically. Um, few studies have found no difference in protein breakdown levels versus maintenance versus energy deficit. And some studies find there is a bit of a, an increase, but it's mostly a decrease in synthesis. Now, logically, if there's a decrease in synthesis and protein breakdown is not changing much, that would decrease protein requirements because the body's using less of it for synthesis, which may perfect, makes perfect sense, right? You're not building much muscle in energy deficit compared to when you're bulking. Now, Eric then conducted his own study on this, where uh, as part of his thesis, it was pretty short and limited, so um, uh, th there, were, there were limitations, but the own, his own study actually didn't find any difference in, uh, or he found that, what was it, 1.6 or 1.8 was still sufficient, even in, strength trainees in energy deficit. And then, but he argued, yeah, because the study had a lot of limitations, I think the theory is still, the theory still warrants higher protein intakes in energy deficits. And that the paper became super, super influential. So basically everyone started referring, referencing to that paper. And uh, for, for me, it, it never made a lot of sense. Like the actual study in the paper didn't support the argument. And the, the theory, like the logical theory of protein kinetics also doesn't support the argument in my view. Plus we have multiple studies showing um, in detail, like I think Hoffman had a great study with people in energy deficit surplus versus maintenance in like free conditions and then free different protein intakes, or at least maintenance and energy deficit. And then seeing do protein requirements actually change when they go into energy deficit, when they go into maintenance, and there's no effect. But then the argument is, okay, there's no effect in sedentary individuals, but there is an effect in strength trainees. And that effect, if you break it down uh, in, in scientific terms, means you're looking for a triple interaction effect. So there is an effect of strength training on protein requirements. And the effect of strength training on protein requirements itself differs for people that are either in maintenance or surplus or energy deficit. Now, just a priori, you can, as a scientist, you want to be pretty skeptical of an argument like that because a triple interaction effect in nature is exceedingly rare. It is exceedingly difficult to demonstrate any kind of triple interaction effect. That's like mm -hmm. scientists generally are in like psychology, for example, they are super happy when they can demonstrate a real interaction effect. For example, something differs in men and women. That is, that's difficult to demonstrate. Eh? And also it's not that common. Like a lot of people think, or let me put it this way, the null hypothesis in nature actually quite often is, is correct. So often there are no differences when, unless we have very good reason there is uh, to believe there is a difference. Now, okay, that's all theory. So if you would just look at the data, there, there are no papers showing higher protein requirements in energy deficits. It's, there's not a single study that's found greater protein requirements in even strength trainees in energy deficit than 1.6 gram per kilogram uh, of body weight, which is the same as in uh, maintenance or when bulking. And, but there are also no good studies I will admit that compare the same trainees in deficit versus maintenance. So the, the good studies we have on untrained individuals, we don't have those on trained individuals. So there's, there's no direct data on the topic. The best we have is I think last year or two years ago now, I think it was last year, Glynn et al, if I'm not mistaken, they did a study where they looked at the protein requirements per meal. You know, the, the cap of the idea if you can only use 20 gram high quality protein in a meal for protein synthesis. Mm -hmm. That's a different argument, but they basically looked at that line of research in strength trainees in energy deficit, 
And they compared that to research with strength trainees doing the same kind of study, which has been done multiple times in energy maintenance or surplus. And they found no difference. So the limited research we have and all of the empirical evidence, as well as I would say the theory, does not support the protein requirements meaningfully change in people in energy deficits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's that was great. And I guess another question that you know people bring up is, is there like an upper limit of what you would recommend? Not so much. I mean, there's no inherent harm in over consuming protein. I think health wise, most of the effects are uh, if you're healthy, you can consume as much protein as you can uh, stomach pretty much. And the first effects are going to be uh, just stomach upset. So for most people, that's that's not going to be a real issue. The main issue in energy deficit is that for one, protein is costly. That's just a practical concern. And secondly, like it's it literally like financially, most protein sources are much more expensive than, for example, grains or you know potatoes or other calorie sources. And uh, secondly, you're spending calories that you cannot spend on fat slash carbs, which might be more beneficial if you're going very low on calories. And especially, I think for most people, it's not a big concern, but if you're looking at competitors, it actually becomes a concern and you really need every calorie that you have. Otherwise, you're typically like the modern, the modern traditional approach has been to just cut out all fat pretty much. And then you still have the carbs and the, the protein you can fit in. But I think that results in a lot of um, hormonal problems, which at least for natural trainees, uh, they, I think they occur quicker when you're going on those almost zero fat diets compared to you still have you know at least 20% or so fat intake in there. Yeah, no, I think, yeah, this is another kind of point where the opportunity cost comes in, where I think okay. people don't talk so much about, you know, maybe you're increasing your protein, but then that means you're decreasing carbs and fats. And especially when we're talking about fat loss here, those start to become more important where you're really hurting for energy and you really want to be maintaining your training performance. So yeah, this is one of those scenarios where in fat loss, my you know protein actually comes down a little bit. I think just because I am not so free with my macros and I really want to be preserving training performance. Yeah, and you also often see that protein quality increases. You know, so that's another argument against even if protein requirements would theoretically increase, which I think, again, makes no sense, but if they did, then it might be offset by the increase in protein quality because typically during a bulk, you're gonna get quite some of your protein from rice or carb sources, if you're on a high carb diet at least. And if you're in energy deficit and you're cutting out the grains and the like, then you're not getting nearly as much protein often from those sources. So the relative proportion of higher quality sources like chicken, fish, dairy is going to increase in the diet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then next going on to carbs and fats, you've already touched on this a little bit, but you know, the high versus low carb debate is uh, a big one. Definitely. That's, I think the first thing to clarify is that there's no difference in fat loss results, whether you go high carb or low carb. There are some papers finding very small differences, but m by and large, the vast majority of the empirical literature that did well-controlled diets and looked at diets of the same energy content and the same protein intake found no differences in the rate of fat loss or even weight loss in um, many different populations. So, you know, as long as you're consuming a given level of calories, a given level of protein, the carb to fat ratio is an issue where I think people devote a lot of attention to, to this issue, but it's actually quite trivial in terms of the fat loss result. And there is some argument to be made for training performance, muscle growth, and all these things, but for fat loss, the data is quite clear. Any difference is going to be marginal. Last year, I think last year, there was actually a paper that provided, or a meta-analysis even, provided reasonable evidence, even though it's from a relatively sketchy camp of low-carb advocates, that low carb diets do seem to increase energy expenditure slightly compared to um, low fat diets. So low carb diets might result in higher energy expenditure, which would theoretically mean that if you, over the long run, you would extrapolate that, it should improve fat loss. But like I said, uh, this isn't the case in the research we have. That usually lasts 12 weeks max. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that people should really be focusing on, you know, the overall calorie intake as, as telling them what, how much fat they're going to be losing. And, you know, with a lot of these diets, when you start getting, into, especially with more you know, fad type diets, like mm-hmm. people lose sight of the fact that it's really the calorie deficit that's doing it. In terms of, you know, really optimizing muscle growth um, and training performance, does the carb intake matter? I think it's going to have a very small effect. We're actually currently in the process of a systematic review paper on carbohydrate requirements for muscle growth. But we already produced kind of a sneak peek of it in our last systematic review on carbohydrate intake for performance, where we looked at 14 studies, and I I think we have only a few extra in the new systematic review. We're, We're not done with the search, so maybe there are still a few, but I doubt I missed any. That the overall body of evidence shows in controlled trials no difference in muscle growth no difference in muscle hypertrophy between even ketogenic diets and high carb diets provided that they have the same protein intake and the same energy intake now on a practical matter what you do often see is that people have a hard time in particular in ketogenic conditions to bulk and in particular i think when your fat intake starts exceeding your protein intake you're getting into an impractical range of diets with ketogenic diets. You know, you're, mm-hmm. you cannot just consume fatty meat anymore. You have to get, because you're out of carbs, you're out of protein at that point. So, and you need some more fats. And then what do you consume? You're just going to add butter or olive oil, olive oil or something. Oil. I mean, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, that's not a great way to live in my, <laughs> um, in my view in the first place. And um, I think for, yeah, for a lot of people, it, it just doesn't, work very well plus ketogenic diets have uh, appetite suppressive effects in a lot of individuals and it just becomes hard to get all the calories in especially when you're already full and the prospect is you need some more calories and then you know you're gonna have to down olive oil or something Uh, i did it um, for a while (laughs) when i was like in my student book days you know uh, no pain no gain but yeah it's, it's not pleasant so what you often see in those studies is that if they're like yeah get into a 10 percent energy surplus then they just can't do it So the keto group loses fat and then the other group gains more muscle. And I think there is a bit of a bias in the evidence-based fitness sphere where people interpret these findings as saying, look, ketogenic diets, they don't facilitate muscle hypertrophy without really scrutinizing that they weren't in energy surplus probably to begin with. And that's fine. You can make that argument, but then you should also look at those studies and see ketogenic diets are superior for fat loss, right? You can't have it both ways. They're either superior for fat loss and not as good for muscle growth or they're uh, the same, and it's all about the energy intake, which I think is the case. I don't think ketogenic diets are superior for fat loss either. At least it's going to be by trivial margins. So I think bo- both effects will be trivial in any case. So yeah, in that sense, I don't think the carb intake matters a lot. And I do think that even if you do a ketogenic diet, and this is also what we recommended in our review, review paper, you want at least 15 gram net carbs pre and typically post-workout as well. So that's, that's not a lot, that's very easy, but it, for example, it rules out faster training and it also rules out the like hardcore carnivore type diets and keto diets where you're really focusing on just piling on the, the coconut oil, the butter and bacon and eggs and really foregoing the fats or the carbs, which I think is a very poor approach to ketogenic diets. I think you should rather try to maximize the carb intake that you can while reaching your level of the desired level of ketosis rather than trying to minimize carb intake as the goal itself. Mm. But that's, that's another thing. So yeah, overall, I'd say that your carb intake is actually not that influential for muscle growth. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember downing olive oil at some point as well. I guess it's a, a rite of passage. <laughs> oh man, I remember fun. one time I had like 1,500 calories left and oh, I, I, I was super full. So I was like, okay, olive oil, super healthy you know, relatively easy way to, to get down 1500 calories. So I had like 15 tablespoons of olive oil and I can tell you there, there is like a certain point where you cross about 400 calories of olive oil, it gets really nasty. You can, at that point, I just, I felt the ball of oil in my stomach (laughs) and I I was so nauseous. I had to lie down, but as I was lying down, I could just feel the the ball of oil, like rolling around in my stomach. And whenever I moved, you could literally just feel, it was like there literally a ball of oil, you know, that 
when you change position, the, you can feel the, the oil just shift. And it was, it was so nasty. It took me like, I think 90 minutes before I could get up out of the couch and just function again, because I was like, if I'm, if I walk up now, I'm just going to puke either because of the sound and the, the, um, the feeling of the oil or just the, the actual gastric upset. <laughs> <laughs> Not recommended. Yeah, I think with, you know, looking at macros, I think it's it's also it is important, though, to think about that in terms of, you know, what's sustainable for you and uh, personal preferences come into play, especially knowing that probably there isn't, you know, as big of a difference as people might say. And then how about fats? I think fats are actually underrated. And mm. this, it actually follows quite logically. I think I recently made a post that your like testosterone levels matter, which is to some people heresy and to some people extremely obvious for, for muscle growth. And th there is quite clear data showing that, especially on testosterone replacement therapy and the like, someone's testosterone level influences, like if you increase their testosterone level, they gain muscle mass, which is, I mean, <laughs> fairly obvious if you, if you put it this way. Um, but a lot of people have this argument that within the reference range, it doesn't matter. Like there's this magical limit, the reference range, and then there's no effect there. And then below it, there is a big effect and above it is an effect. And in between, nothing happens. And that just doesn't make any sense. That's again, one of those things. You don't see that in nature. You don't see like a curve which goes up and then it's completely flat lines for a certain period and then goes up again. That is it's almost unheard of in nature. In any case, uh, that aside, the, the research is quite clear that your testosterone level does in fact matter. Smaller differences, of course, have smaller effects. So I think typically, um, if you look at the data, it's like one pound per hundred in the reference range that goes from like 300 to 1300. So theoretically, if you were to gain, you would go from like the super low end, you're not clinically hypogonadal, but you go from the super low end to like the super top end, which is not very realistic, but let's say that would happen. Then you could gain about a, a thousand uh, on the range. I always forget the, the units. I think it's nanogram per deciliter. Yeah, there's like multiple ranges in use. And, uh, but it's a range that goes from like 300 to 1300. So that's a thousand and it would be like um, 10 pounds. You would gain like 10 pounds of fat-free mass. And that's without training. So with training, you would probably increase that more. Now, if you gain say 50% extra muscle mass, then it would probably be in your lifetime, it would be 15 pounds extra fat-free mass potential. So that would be very substantial. Not like, not steroid-like, but very potential, um, big. Uh, most people don't, don't get nearly that effect. Typically on higher fat diets, you get maybe a 20% increase in your testosterone level. And if you're say at 700 and you add 700, which is quite good, and you add 20% of that, which is again, good. Then you have 150, so you're gonna gain like 1.5 pounds. You would gain maybe two pounds combined with strength training over the course of your life. Yeah, that's not a big effect anymore, right? But it does quite logically follow. We know that high fat diets increase testosterone levels and we know that higher testosterone levels increase muscle mass. Mm -hmm. There are small effects, but I think it's quite hard to argue against the logical continuation of these facts that therefore higher fat diets should increase muscle growth. Not much, but a little bit. And I think it becomes more significant when you get to contest prep and the like, because a lot of people in contest prep are actually hypogonadal. Like they literally, they're testosterone levels, both men and women, they tank below the reference range. So some bodybuilders on stage are, some have literally castrate level testosterone levels because of the, the super high stress. You are, you're basically 1% away from death in terms of body fat. Mm -hmm. And like, it's an extreme sport and you get an extreme look. And, but for your body, it's, you know, it's very intense. So uh, I think if you can keep that up a at least a little bit, then the effects are typically larger than one pounds per hundred in the range. And so, you know, for a bodybuilding competitor, it might, uh, it might make some difference, especially to an advanced competitor. Again, we're talking maybe a few pounds over the super long term, but um, that can be uh, worthwhile for, uh, for competitors. Yeah, so what would you say is like a minimum that people should be sticking to for fat intake? It, yeah, that's hard to say. There's not a lot of research on this, but I would go based on the hormonal data with about 20% of energy intake. Now, and ideally you would like to base this on body weight or something, just like protein requirements, but we simply don't have those data. So I'm, and there's also the point where you can say, look, I want a one gram 
per kilo of body weight of fat. And that's great. Okay, you want that. But then if you you just have to push your calories to the yeah. level where you don't have those calories. You want it. It's like, yeah, it's, <laughs> okay, you want it, great. <laughs> but uh, you can't. So yeah, I, I think 20% of energy intake is, is very practical in that sense because, well, unless you want to go keto, you, you, know, you also need some carbs. And typically I recommend if you're not going keto, you want to keep the carbs above 100, 100 net, and preferably closer to 200. Because if you fall into that range where you're, you're not ketogenic, but your carbs are below 100, I find that a lot of people, they feel really poorly. And I think that's also a significant part of the bad reputation that low carb diets have. Or um, in some um, populations, they, they don't really go ketogenic and they don't keto adapt. So you're, you're kind of in this range where you don't have carbs to fuel performance, but you're also not keto adapted. And you probably are dipping in and out of ketosis sometimes. Like in the morning, mm. you may actually be dipping into ketosis, but you're not keto adapted, so you get keto flu. Yeah, and you kind of just, yeah, you're kind of spending your life in that limbo. And uh, yeah, most people just feel horrible. Whether that actually impacts your physique directly, it may not, but it's certainly going to impact your uh, adherence. Mm -hmm. And then, so that 20%, like it basically like even a say contest prep client for yourself then mm -hmm. you know when things get really extreme that's kind of like your you know hard line that you don't you don't sacrifice fats for carbs yeah again it's i would like to draw a hard line in the sand based on the hormonal data but especially short term and if you're say two weeks out in two weeks you're not going to tank your hormone levels or even if you do it's going to take the effects are mostly genomic so they take typically a month or more to manifest Mm. So you have kind of some leeway there the last month or so before you could you could basically tank your testosterone levels and it won't yet impact your physique. Now, if you were going to stay at that body fat level or if you know that your next show is, say, two months later and you have to be just as shredded, then you have to uh, you, you probably want to keep the fats in as a natural competitor because, yeah, otherwise you're going to you're going to feel the effects of that. But sometimes, like I said, even with the, even if you're using 20% of energy intake, if someone just gets really hungry and their calories have to get really low, for example, you have female bikini competitor and they're like the, the ones with the sucky genetics and they have to go to like 1100 calories on training days. And yeah. yeah, that sucks. So, and then you want to get your protein in and then maybe the 20% fat is already, is pushing it. Like you, you, maybe you have the calories theoretically, but you really don't want to waste any calories on uh, on fats for satiety, typically. I mean, you, typically I tell them like, try to go with olives and avocado. That's like as satiating as it gets for fat sources. But then during contest prep also, there's the issue with fault maps with avocado. So you don't want to be bloated on stage. And yeah, some people don't like avocado or it's extremely expensive. So yeah, then if you have to go with um, other fat sources, it's, you really would hate to spend some of your calories on say fatty beef because it doesn't provide a lot of satiety, at least not short term. So yeah, sometimes I'm like, okay, we're just gonna make sure you're not completely starving and uh, we're, we're gonna compromise on the fats, um, preferably temporarily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that satiety is a big player when it comes into choosing macros. And especially mm -hmm. like, I think, you know, for different people, some people will respond better than others. Like some, for some yeah. people, fats are very satiating and for some people like, like not. And, you know, ultimately consistency is going to be key with your fat loss and you really got to find something that allows you to live. <laughs> yes. And there, there's some research that women in, in general have greater satiating effects of fat than men. And I find in my clients that's also generally true. Also, the hormonal literature, I would say, is stronger in women than in men for the effects of not just testosterone, but also growth hormone levels, um, estrogen levels, which estrogen is also anti-catabolic. So there's more, more to be gained in women, I feel, from keeping fat intake up compared to men, where especially short term, men can sacrifice it with fewer immediate costs. Mm -hmm. And this sparks another question I've kind of had, which, you know, people don't really talk so much about, but, you know, comes into play when you get into the more extreme levels of macros for fat loss. What's the role of cholesterol and saturated fat for, you know, muscle growth? Mm -hmm. Yeah, saturated fat has a quite a direct and potent effect on testosterone production. Of the free fatty acids, um, 
four of the, the three types of uh, fat, like monounsaturated, polyunsaturated, saturated. Saturated seems to have the strongest direct link, also me mechanistically, um, as well as cholesterol with testosterone production, because all basically all steroid hormones are produced from, from cholesterol, mm -hmm. and you can produce cholesterol with saturated fat. So there is that link, but most research finds the total fat intake is most important. And then maybe saturated fat is, you know, a bit relatively more important than the others. But if you're just getting a lot of all fats, then you're probably going to be okay with a, a decent mix. I don't feel you have to go out of your way to make sure you're maximizing saturated fat. Also health-wise, that might not be okay for all people. And then cholesterol is interesting. I wrote an article which I called Cholesterol the Forgotten Anabolic, where I argue basically that we actually have quite some research indicating cholesterol, both mechanistically via, for example, uh, lipid draft formation and anabolic signaling, and via improving um, hormone production, can aid muscle growth and increase protein synthesis, even acutely, which is probably due to the lipid, lipid draft formation and um, potentiating anabolic signaling. And Research directly in strength trainees has been quite mixed on this. I think one study did not see, a recent study, the last one on this, did not see a difference in muscle growth or strength development, but they found greater fat loss in the group consuming higher cholesterol intake, which would suggest that they were in greater energy deficit and still getting the same muscle growth and strength development, thereby potentially meaning if they were in the same energy balance, they could have gained more. Mm. So research is not cl crystal clear on this, but there are quite some hints that cholesterol has anabolic effects in muscle tissue. And it's therefore good to have maybe 400, 300 to 400 minimum milligram cholesterol. And then for those super worried about cholesterol, oh my God, it's gonna clock my arteries and kill me. Uh, that's probably not the case. I think even the official guidelines for Americans have now dropped cholesterol and European yep. guidelines as well as, as being something that, well, as the media portrays it, as like it's gonna, you know, it's some, something you consume that clocks up your arteries and kills you. Uh, in fact, most dietary cholesterol intakes have no or minimal effects on blood cholesterol levels to begin with. Like the body regulates that quite well. So I feel it's quite safe and potentially beneficial. So I typically recommend that athletes, especially those in contest prep and super serious, they pay attention to consuming some cholesterol as well. If you have a few eggs in your diet, that's it, you're done. So it's not that hard either. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's kind of an interesting point where it comes more to play when your macros get extreme, where like mm -hmm. when people are trying to rid their diet of any kind of fat, kind of yeah. pro approach. Definitely. And then not really a macro, but how do you, you know, approach fiber when it comes to fat loss? Fiber, I think, is super important for practical reasons. And it's, I mean, it also has some physiological effects. It can increase the thermic effect of food and decrease the uh, the energy yield from the diet. But most studies that look at this, you're talking about a few percent at most. So directly, given the same calorie intake, fiber is not going to have huge effects on fat loss, but it's going to make the process a lot more enjoyable because mm -hmm. you're going to be more satiated, you're going to be healthier, you're going to overall feel better typically if your digestion doesn't get uh, issues, but that's usually not due to fiber intake but more so due to specific types of fiber called fault maps. So fermentable types of fiber that some people don't react well to. Uh, and yeah, basically the higher the fiber, the easier the diet adherence. I think uh, the last meta-analysis on this found that increasing your fiber by, I have to stretch my memory here. I think it was every 10% increase or every 10 grams increase in fiber is results in a five to 10% decrease in ad libitum energy intake which is huge. Mm. It means that if you're, that theoretically, if you would extrapolate those findings, it would mean that if you go up your, from your fiber to like 20 to 60 grams per day, which is, I think, very realistic for um, for most men, like strength trainees, then yeah, you, you'd basically effortlessly go into energy deficit. You wouldn't even have to tell them to track their macros. And that's certainly my experience. If you take someone with a low fiber diet and you're just gonna change the food choices around to make sure that they get a lot of fiber and then not the grains, but like, actually good fiber sources, like fiber, high fiber per calorie content, like vegetables, fruits, uh, certain types of beans, even potatoes can be not, not bad, but vegetables typically are uh, king for sure. Then yeah, 
it's they typically end up in energy deficit just because it's so satiating and you have so much food volume in the diet that you, you can't eat more calories. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> Vegetables are like my best friend <laughs> mm -hmm. in contest prep. And then, yeah, I wanted to also circle back and talk a little bit about, you know, specific food choices. When it comes to, say, protein, does it matter in terms of what type of protein you ingest? Definitely. For example, um, I mean, there's this idea that more protein is more satiating. And even many researchers have espoused this belief, but it's simply not in line with the data. We published um, a paper where we directly compared protein intakes of 1.8 versus 2.7 gram per kilogram per day in strength trainees in energy deficit. And we, across three different experiments on multiple measures, we basically found no effect of protein being more satiating than in this, in our case, particularly carbs. So, and I think practically, this is also blatantly evident. If you consume a whey protein shake, like tell me how satiated you are. Yeah. It, it's not, in fact, I typically get hungry from whey protein shakes. If I'm in the morning and I'm not, I haven't eaten yet and I consume a whey shake, it's like my hunger is like, ah, <laughs> that's right, food. So, and suddenly I'm, I'm hungry. I don't know if it's the effect of the, the insulin spike or just the fact that it's sweet taste and um, like no, no substance, there's no chewing, no mastication that also has negative effects on satiety. So yeah, the protein source is super important, just like with anything. Uh, in fact, I would go so far as to say that most people in fitness tend to overvalue macros and undervalue food choices mm. for practical purposes. Because like we said, like the carbohydrate intake is probably not that important fat intake. And we were also talking about fine tuning protein intake. Yeah, you, you need enough, but most research finds even 1.6. I, I typically advocate 1.8 gram per kilogram per day uh, is enough. And yeah, that, so you have actually quite some leeway with the macros and it's mostly fine tuning, but food choices are crucial for practical diet adherence. Yeah. Because if you're starving all the time, like nobody sustains a diet like that. So high fiber foods, low calorie, um, low energy density foods and foods that are very hard and chewy and um, don't, don't have a lot of calories compared to how much volume they have. Th those are great. So in terms of protein sources, it, you wouldn't be talking about a whey shake, but you would be talking about like the, the super thick kind of Greek yogurt or quark or cottage cheese, you know, the kind you can, uh, you can open the lid and then hold it upside down and then it doesn't fall out, yeah. then y you know that's the that's the good stuff. I think uh, Fage, <laughs> has, uh, Fage is very important, very popular in a lot of countries and it's, I, I just had it this morning, it's like, it's so thick. <laughs> it, it's not the best in terms of taste, but it's really satiating because it's like you're eating cement. <laughs> <laughs> and it has a much bigger effect on, a much more filling effect than a whey shake, for example. Mm -hmm. And then how about the rates that, you know, that protein digests at different sources? Yeah, it's, it's correlated with how satiating it is. And typically like fast absorption and all these things are mostly hyped by supplement companies, but in reality, the slower kind of absorption, digestion is better for uh, satiety. And sometimes the differences are quite peculiar. For example, there's research that goat milk is more satiating than cow milk, even though the macros are nearly identical. And that's like, <laughs> Yeah, milk why, sales why going is. up after this podcast. Yeah, <laughs> why, why that is is uh, remains a mystery. But some of these things, a lot of these things are also just mental. Like there are huge, huge psychological effects of uh, what you eat and how it influences your society. And if you really believe, like you're an adamant believer that you need like high carb, high protein, for example, and you eat that, then that in itself plays a big part in, in your success, for example. And then how about the, you know, specific carb sources in terms of, yeah, I guess people always talk about complex versus simple carbs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, complex versus simple carbs is quite an arbitrary distinction. Mm -hmm. um, basically looking at the, um, like the carbon chain and just uh, arbitrary cutoff in, in terms of how many sugars there are, really doesn't have any physiological significance. And the GI and the uh, glycemic load, glycemic index, even the insulin index have also been found to be almost uncorrelated with how satiating carbs are. 
I think what I actually often do is I often recommend just fiber. Like forget about carbs altogether. Just make sure you consume enough fiber. Mm. And then I know your carbs are going to be fine anyway. Um, like you're, you're going to have enough. Unless you're, you know, a mixed strength endurance athlete, you play soccer, those kind of things. If you're just doing strength training, then probably that's, you know, that's enough for uh, in terms of carbohydrate requirements. And yeah, then you're you're focused on the good things because a lot of people also, you know, I know people that are like in a diet and they they have some calories left and they feel like they need some carbs, either pre-workout or at another time. And then they're literally eating things like candy because they they need the, the carbs. Mm-hmm. And if you're like your primary goal is fat loss and you're eating candy because you feel like you need the carbs. Yeah, I, I don't think that's uh, prioritizing the right goals. You know, you'd be so much better off eating an apple, for example, in terms of satiety and uh, not to mention health and the like. Yeah, I think this is one of those things about food choices that you mentioned that, you know, people sometimes get misled in the fitness industry where, say, like with the protein thing, people kind of po- cobble together their macros. They're like, oh, I need some protein. Well, let's have a protein shake, you know, or people are like, oh, well, I got to have some some sugar, like peri workout. Exactly. And I think even, I think one of the biggest effects that, or one of the things that makes the most impact uh, in my clients is that I tell them to think recipe first and then tweak the recipe to fit your macros rather than think macros first. Because a lot of people, they make their diet macros first and then you get diets like, uh, oh, I have 20 gram protein, so whey shake. And then I have five gram fats, so I get handful of nuts or something and oh i have uh, 30 grams carbs so i have a bit of oatmeal and then i guess you're going to consume that with water uh, because you don't have any calories anymore so you have like oatmeal with water a, bit, a few nuts and a whey shake and it's like that's not a meal <laughs> <laughs> that's that's not an enjoyable way to go for life you know eating these these little handfuls of different items that happen to fill your macros it's much better to think okay what do i like as a recipe Maybe I want to eat pasta or something and then tweak it. If you don't have the carbs, for example, replace it with shiitake noodles or, you know, replace rice with potatoes or pasta with potatoes and, you know, or just uh, or zoodles. And if you don't have the fats, then switch to low fat beef. If you want more fat, switch to full fat beef or yeah, cheese or whatever. But you can tweak the recipe so that you still have an enjoyable meal that actually feels like a meal that's enjoyable and satiating and that also fits your macros rather than this random combination of ingredients that happens to fit some largely arbitrary configured configuration of macros. Yeah, I think there's kind of a, a funny consequence that has come out of the if it fits your macros generation where, you know, we walk into a grocery store, we're like, okay, these are my target macros. <laughs> yeah. Put things together also with like Lego. Food choices. They, you know, you talk about like carbs and I mean, carbs can be sugar, or it can be oatmeal, or it can be broccoli. And those are completely different foods. <laughs> you know, also in terms of the eating experience, how much you can eat of them, how likely it is you're gonna under or overeat. So yeah, I don't think it, I don't think it's very valuable in most cases to think in terms of these macro categories, first and foremost, rather than thinking of food choices. Mm-hmm. And then for yourself, Menno, what are your favorite you know, low calorie density foods when things get really lean? It depends a lot on where I am. Like there are a lot of tropical fruits, for example, that are great, um, like star fruits and hog plums, but you don't typically find those in um, mm. in, in like non-tropical countries. Um, I like berries a lot. Berries are super, they're both satiating and super nutritious for, uh, you asked about carbs, right? Or yeah, just in general. Yeah. Protein sources, like protein source is pretty standard, like white fish or shellfish. Shellfish is actually super underrated because mm. like most people know fish and poultry and meat and dairy, but shellfish is on a league of its own because it's like white fish, except it has only half the protein content. And then most people are like, damn it, it has only has half the protein. But the beauty is that you have the same volume of food with just half the protein. So you can eat twice as much food to get your protein in again. Mm-hmm. So what you can often buy is, for example, frozen. You have these packs with mollusks and all these other types of shellfish, and they're not expensive. Yeah. They're satiating, and they're actually really good. 
Um, not difficult to make. You can just boil them and add some mustard or something. And yeah, you can eat a lot more of those than white fish because white fish just, you know, it goes down too easily essentially for, for satiety. And egg whites are also extremely underrated because it, just like with the shellfish, egg whites have basically nothing but protein and water, which makes them uniquely low in energy density. You can have a lot, a lot of egg whites and they are super satiating because they also, you have the effects that egg have where it's kind of, you can beat it. So it adds in, in volume. Mm. So I like to eat a lot of um, wraps and things with that are, if I think like pancake, I think like how many egg whites can I stuff in here? Like it's, it's yeah. not about how, um, you know, how do I, if like one or two eggs, you need them for the, the texture. I'm like, how many egg whites can I possibly stuff in here without it ruining the plate? <laughs> and th that's like the base, right? And then you can add some other stuff and then maybe you need some grains to make sure it doesn't become like a, a eggy mess. It actually still has like the a wrap texture or something. <laughs> Uh, but it, it's super, super satiating. And in terms of fats, I also already alluded, I think actually the least chosen options almost for fats are actually the most satiating. Avocado and olives. Avocado and mm -hmm. olives are king. Olives mm -hmm. in general are super underrated because nice. many people like olives. And I mean, they're, they're can be expensive. That's, that's the thing, of course. But many people like olives and they have excellent macros and an extremely good track record for health. Like mm -hmm. olives are, mm -hmm. everyone knows how healthy extra virgin olive oil is. Now, that's the processed version of olives. So you add fiber to that and, yeah. and uh, phytochemicals and the like and all the good stuff that you find in plants. And then you have olives. So olives are, like, I think, one of the most um, hidden or uh, neglected superfoods, if you will, at least in, in bodybuilding circles, because, you know, they're a staple of Mediterranean diet. And yeah, like I said, avocado is great because it's a great source of fats, lots of fiber, lots of nutrients, and you can make great things with it. Um, other than that, yeah, most fats aren't that satiating other than just having the fats, but the fats, they don't provide a lot of acute because um, they don't have a lot of volume. And then carbs, yeah, mostly is the veggies and noodles, shiritake noodles, like the miracle noodles, they're great if, you're, if you tolerate them. And yeah, like I said, fibrous fruits, so that was like, I think the known, known good stuff. Yeah, I love it. Going to be uh, going to the grocery store after this. <laughs> so yeah, wrapping up here, I think this has been a really productive conversation, Meadow. Um, I guess a fun question. Mm -hmm. Do you have a most funny fat loss story? Most funny fat loss story? Well. I had one couple as clients for a long time, and I guess it's kind of tangent to what we what we talked about. They, the girl especially, at some point basically stopped losing fat. Her fat loss was really slow, and I had her on 1,200 calories. And typically, when a woman is on 1,200 calories on training days, I'm like, either something's wrong, or we should check like your you know blood work because we might actually be talking about something like hypothyroidism or something like some women have to go lower than that, but it's, it's not the norm. And typically there are other indications. You can see it in the kind of genetics and stuff, but this, this, that not, she had none of the indications and her boyfriend, my also was also clients was also doing okay, but not like, I felt like the numbers were lower than they should have been. And I was like, okay, maybe they have slow metabolism. Did a lot of checks, all my unusual checks. Um, you know, I have systemic, I have kind of questions actually that are inspired by how police catch liars. <laughs> that's how you, um, that's simply the scientific kind of approach to nice. detect uh, non-adherence with diets. You have to ask very specific questions. Like many people just ask like, are you adherent with the diet? And then everyone's like, they just feel like saying yes, even though they know maybe that they're not. And then often they also don't realize that they're not because, you know, you don't know what you're forgetting. So you have to be like, are you tracking this? Are you tracking your foods raw instead of um, when cooked? Are you using the label? Are you maybe using the wrong database in my fitness pal to, to track? Are you not forgetting your the stuff you put in your coffee? Are you, you know, in the last seven days, what was your protein intake? What was this? Can you produce your macros? Do you have a meal plan? Yada, yada, yada. Everything turned out well. The first I checked it once and at some point I was like, okay, I'm just going to do the entire checklist again. And then 
the guy was like everything seven out of seven days everything was good it was good it was good and the girl was like six out of seven six out of seven six out of seven and i was like so what's that last day because we we didn't we, i've never heard anything about this everything so far has been great and she's like yeah that's our weekly chocolate day i'm like your weekly chocolate day she's like yes so once a week we this is like something we've always done and we really love it. Once a week, we just have as much chocolate as we want, like all the chocolate we want. <laughs> that is great. And like we've been doing this the entire coaching. And it's like yes. And I'm like, yeah, that's that's a problem. That's a lot of calories. I mean, if you really insist on a cheat day or something, maybe we can, you know, potato or something. But chocolate is extremely caloric. So if you have an all-you-can-eat chocolate day. You have to suffer a lot to make up for that. And that's what is happening now. You're suffering a lot six days a week to, have, to fit in that one chocolate day. And they're like, oh my God, we are so disappointed. You are like the seventh co coach we've hired and they all say the same thing. We really thought you would make a difference. And like, <laughs> okay, you know, it's, can't work with this. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if they still have chocolate day, but um, <laughs> you destroyed their the, the moral of the story, Yeah, moral of the story is calories count, and if once a week you feel like screw it, sorry, but you know calories count. They rack up, and then yeah, there is a limit to how much you can compensate for that, especially when it's something like chocolate. <laughs> Try to resist the all you can eat chocolate days. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. And anything new on your end, Meno? research or I'm courses my or... Next book. yeah we're gonna Sick. be not gonna be out for a while but it's gonna be about kind of evidence-based lifestyle design like all the big choices people make in their life i'm gonna dig into all the research or i have dug into all the research and now compiling all my notes and actually turning it into a book and there is also an app most likely coming which has now been <laughs> over a decade in the making cybernetic fitness which is a, a workout and nutrition app so it's not just a nutrition, it's not a tracker, it's actually a cybernetic coach. Like it's, it has AI with algorithms that create your entire meal plan, your program, your diet, even your meal plan, like it will tell you exact recipes and the like. And I think it's going to be pretty sweet, but it's so much work because we want to do it much better than most apps are just if then logic and simple templates. And our app actually has algorithms and AI. So it's, it was almost too difficult to pack it into an app to begin with. We needed actual software engineers that produce like video games for good companies, you know, rather than web designers. And, but I think early 2023, hopefully that would be sweet. That sounds amazing, man. So yeah, well, anyways, I'll link Menno in the description below and thanks again for being on the show. My pleasure.